Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to an introduction to the history of architecture in India Architecture is one of the most important expressions of human society and it reflects artisanal cultural philosophical and technological processes of every period and place in a country that is archaeologically rich and has a long history such as india we have over 5000 years of the architectural record from which we can understand the societies and people who built these sites architecture will thus provide a narrative for us for the history of india from the beginning of the bronze age reflected here by the indus valley civilization right on through a period of vedic culture when you have these sacrificial altars called chittis being built in bricks through the early buddhist period when you have ashokan pillars and a number of cave sites through early hindu expressions of piety such as the caves at udaigiri built by the guptas the shore temples of mahabalipuram built in the 6th 7th century the palace of tirumala nayak in tanjavur which is an expression of early modernity built in the 17th century the bibi ka maqbara built by the moguls as part of their imperial prowess around the same time the imam bada in lucknow built as early modern architecture in the 18th century by the nawabs of awadh the bombay municipal corporation building a fine example of colonial architecture art deco buildings in bombay and madras and other places around india which show the integration of india into the international world of architectural styles and finally architecture from the republic of india such as the hall of nations built by raj rewal in new delhi at pragati maidan thus we shall see through a period of several thousand years that architecture is an expression of function of construction and technology of religion and cosmology of laws and regulations social structures hierarchies historical specificities climate and terrain and also a history of conquest and borrowing as various groups of people move in and out of india lending ideas and borrowing ideas thus architecture and the history of architecture can be seen as an amalgamation of several strands of human endeavor from the literary and the critical the cultural and the urban from theory theories of evolution from science from performing arts everything comes together as architecture demonstrating not just the capacity of a society to build things but also demonstrating to future generations what the aspirations of those societies were please join us over the next 8 sessions in studying the history of architecture in india after which you will have a much richer understanding of our built heritage thank you Today we will look at early architecture in India starting with the bronze age going right up to the decline of buddhism in India The Indus Valley civilization which is considered to be in the middle of the bronze age in the northwest corner of an undivided India was followed by a vedic culture because of people who moved in from the caucasus mountains in Europe In South India simultaneously we have megaliths all of these developments will be followed by kingdoms in central and north india the birth of the buddha and of mahavira the rise of the mauryas with emperor ashok expanding the mauryan kingdom and then the beginnings of temple hinduism In the meantime Buddhist cave sites will have chaityas and also viharas and we start getting somewhere around the 2nd 3rd 4th century CE free standing temples the first one being temple 17 at Sanchi But to begin with we have to start with the Indus valley a civilization which is divided into three even phases early mature and late the indus valley is characterized by 
a uniformity of measures and standards that you find across a very large area. They construct big urban centers in bricks. The bricks are of uniform measurements. Most of the layouts are gridiron, which is to say streets are laid at right angles to each other. And you have very sophisticated systems of drainage and sewage in all the cities of the Indus. The Indus Valley sites, such as the ones at Mohenjo-daro and Harappa, and also Rakhi Gadi in India, and the port site of Lothal, which is in Gujarat, have all been excavated extensively, yielding a rich corpus of artifacts and small finds. But it is the architecture that is of significance to us, and the architecture is absolutely unique, not just for its modularity, but also for its massive scale. The bricks are of standard size, there seems to be some kind of centralized control over the whole civilization by which people conform to a standard set of weights and measurements. The drainage systems in the Indus Valley have been the subject of a lot of discussion because it's the only Bronze Age site where we see neatly laid out drain and sewage systems. These are lined with bricks and a lot of times you have them completely concealed and covered with places from where you can inspect them, manholes of an ancient kind. Though we do not understand a lot about the hierarchy of this society, what their modes of worship were, what their religion was, and what their governance structures were, there have been a lot of theories that suggest it was some form of perhaps a republic where more people had a say in governance than just one monarch. In, in this is characterized by a number of objects such as toys with wheels as the one you see on your left and what is called redware with this black slip. You also have a number of characteristic seals found in the Indus with what appear to be letters on top but nobody has been able to successfully or satisfactorily decipher the script yet. You do see the representation of a lot of local fauna, such as rhinos, elephants and buffaloes. And you also have what seem to be some form of sacrificial posts with a bull tied to it. These will all be ideas that will carry over into later Hinduism. Now, for the history of North India in particular, developments on the Iranian plateau are very important. And the big reason is that the Indus Valley civilization itself seems to have enormous connections with two areas. One is the Iranian plateau where you have the Elamites in the Bronze Age and also with an archaeological set of sites called BMAC, the Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex which is in Afghanistan and Central Asia. But what is happening in Iran at the same time as the Indus Valley civilization is the creation of other kinds of artifacts, but most notably writing. The tablet you see on top actually contains writing that has been deciphered. What you see at the bottom is a seal, but not the object of the seal, but a sealing instead, a seal which has been used to impress clay. The Indus Valley civilization goes into decline sometime around 17 to 1500 BCE, largely as a result of changes in the environment. There are big floods. We have a whole geological record of how the climate must have changed and how the landscape changed. And this whole civilization went into decline. A group of nomadic peoples called the Indo-Europeans moved in in multiple waves over the next several hundred years to occupy what would be the Gangetic Plain, eventually to be called North India. These people moved in many ways, some pockets stayed on in Iran and their history is largely reconstructed on the basis of linguistics, not of architecture because they had very little architecture. 
the linguistic movements of these people have been well mapped through a body of knowledge called Indo-European linguistics. And you have similar kinds of words occurring in languages all the way from Europe to India. So these people, though they are called Indo-Europeans, are not necessarily an ethnic group so much as a linguistic group. They do not leave behind a big record of architecture because they were itinerant, they were nomadic, they were pastoralists. They bred cows and their wealth was measured in terms of cattle. They worshipped gods who lived in heavens above and these gods had to be appeased periodically by giving them offerings in the form of sacrifices. And there is a very elaborate set of texts called the Shulba Shastras or the Shulba Sutras which was written by these people in which how to construct altars of various kind. Here you see a model of an altar that's in the shape of a bird but altars of various kinds with various kinds of ritual implements. And you make offerings to please the gods which maintains a certain kind of world order. The Shulba Sutras have been translated and they are the beginnings of what is later called Vedic geometry because you have a lot of geometrical principles that get used in the construction of these elaborate altars. In parts of India, before the movement of the Vedic peoples, there had been a number of autochthonous cults, most notably those worshipping serpent deities and forest deities called Nagas and Yakshas. And we do have traces of idols and imagery of these venerated deities. In fact, a scholar, Johann Bronkhorst, wrote a book called Greater Magdha, in which the interactions of previous religions in India with the movement of Vedic culture is demonstrated quite nicely. Simultaneously, in South India, particularly in Andhra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Kerala, you had a number of megaliths dated to somewhere between 1500 BC to 300 BC. These are in the forms of menhirs, dolmens and other kinds of structures associated with megaliths or megalithic societies the world over. Menhirs are freestanding big rock columns, dolmens are these structures in which a number of uprights will support a flat slab on top. These have been recorded for over 150 years at this point, but unfortunately all of them are under great threat as they are being encroached upon and disappearing rather fast. Sri Kumar Menon has done extensive research on these megalithic sites. The architecture of the early historic period in India is tied up with the history of the Iranian plateau in ways that we shall see. Around the 6th century, 5th century BC, a lot of the Indian subcontinent was divided into what are called Janapadas or Mahajanapadas, which, were cons which, which are thought of as small republics, all independently ruled by some kind of oligarchical system. It is in this period that you have the rise of two great thinkers in eastern India, both of whom are born within the same century, Gautama Buddha and Mahavira. Both of them were depicted only several hundred years after their death and therefore the depictions, the standard depictions of both Buddha and Mahavira derive from a source that is common and much later. These are both sculptures from the first century CE. But what is happening on the Iranian plateau at this point is of particular interest because it will shape the first empire that we know which rules over North India and it, it is this empire that will leave us with the first architectural vestiges. But to begin with, in Iran, 
what you do have is the large Achaemenid Empire ruled by people like Cyrus and Darius and Xerxes. These are the famous Persians who are constantly at war with the ancient Greeks. They have an expansive empire and they build themselves a grand capital at a site called Persepolis, not far away from modern day Shiraz. It is at Persepolis that they build massive palaces and halls of which only spotty remains are to be found now. But the centerpiece of this whole complex is a large hall called the Apadana in which people would have been received from different parts of the empire on the day of Nauru's, which was celebrated in great style. Well, what happened to this palace and why does it survive in this form? These are pictures of processions of people who would have come in from different parts of the empire, processed through the palace and made offerings to the king. All that remains are these columns now and the reason is that in 327 BC, a young man from Macedonia called Alexander swept through with his armies across the Iranian plateau, completely destroyed the Achaemenid kingdom, that is to say the kingdom of the ancient Persians, and burnt down their palaces, of which we have descriptions from contemporary Greek sources. Now, all this destruction resulted in only the most imperishable materials surviving and those were the stone platforms and the stone columns. The palaces which were built largely in wood are all gone. And so what you see as a remnant of imperial might in the 4th century BC are these big columns with capitals of animal shape on top. The other thing that the Achaemenids leave behind is a massive tradition of stone cut architecture. Just behind Persepolis is this site which is a set of rock cut funerary monuments to the Achaemenid emperors. The third thing we have from the Achaemenids which will make its way into India is monumental writing. Royal edicts put up on stone in prominent places where travelers would see them. It is unlikely that anybody actually read what was written, but the idea was that the royal world would be displayed prominently and people would know what it meant. And this is what this inscription, the Bisutun inscription looks like in real life. Well, all three things make their way over to India after this destruction of the Achaemenids by Alexander. Alexander manages to control and conquer all of the Achaemenid lands, but then he dies before going back and his whole empire that he is building up crumbles and is replaced by a lot of small regional kingdoms. Well, the reason why the history of India is tied up with the history of Iran is because as the Achaemenid empire disappears, a new empire appears in India around the same time that of Chandragupta Maurya, who then has sustained contacts not only with the remnants of the Achaemenids, but also the new colonizers of the whole area who are all Greeks. What you, are, what you see, the Indo-Greeks, the Seleucids, the Bactrians, a number of kingdoms grow up between Afghanistan, Iran and India. These are all Greek-speaking, ethnic Greek populations that build large cities and rule. A lot of them have served in Alexander's army and these commanders and generals are only too happy to set up their own little kingdoms. Eventually, when the Mauryan Empire goes into decline, you have the Parthian Empire rise in Iran and the Kushans who come out of Central Asia will eventually unite the Iranian plateau and North India into one state formation. But of interest now is what happens to the Mauryas in the immediate aftermath of the Achaemenids. The Mauryas have sustained contact 
with the Greek kingdoms that arise on the northwest of India. We know of people like Menander called Melinda in Sanskritic sources, but we also know of Greek sources that describe people like Chandragupta Maurya, calling him Sandrocotus. The third generation, that is to say the grandson of Chandragupta Maurya, embraces Buddhism, but it is under him that the Mauryan Empire has grown to its largest. He embraces Buddhism because he is very disturbed by the battlefield that he sees after the war of Kalinga. His embrace of Buddhism means he will not fight wars anymore, but set up edicts and columns all across India like this one, which is at Laurya Nandangad in Bihar. The famous capital which is used as the emblem of the Republic of India is also an Ashokan capital, the Four Lions. Where does the inspiration for these kind of monuments come from? It clearly comes from the columns that you see at Persepolis, which what survives of the palace is only columns capped by a capital in the form of an animal. The other thing Ashoka borrows from the Achaemenids is monumental writing. This is an Ashokan pillar at Lumbini, the birthplace of the Buddha, on which you have a standard edict that you find on Ashokan pillars. So already two of the three things that we've seen in Achaemenid imperial architecture has been borrowed by the Mauryas as soon as Ashoka embraces Buddhism. Here is a comparison between what you see as a capital on an Achaemenid column at Persepolis and an Ashokan column on the right hand side. When you look at freestanding columns such as the one at Vaishali on the right hand side and compare it with what you see at Persepolis, it is not a stretch of imagination to see how the Achaemenid columns would inspire the Mauryan columns as markers of imperial grandeur, of imperial might and providing an imperial message in the form of an inscription. Again on the left you have a column capital from Persepolis, on the right hand side you have a pillar from the National Museum in Delhi. Notice the exactly the same shapes that are being borrowed by Indian artisans. The Achaemenids will at the western edge of their empire in modern day Turkey at a place called Lycia have a tradition of tombs that are built in living rock. Already in the 5th century BC these are being constructed on the western end of the Achaemenid empire. The Achaemenid kings will build tombs for themselves like this behind Persepolis and within a couple of hundred years in the middle of the 3rd century BCE at a place called the Barabar Hills in Bihar you have a similar set of excavated caves in this case not to house the mortal remains of a dead person but these are caves which actually are meant to house ascetics and we know this from an inscription on the site which says that they were made for a set of wandering ascetics called the Ajivikas by somebody from the Maurya dynasty. There are multiple caves with different kinds of openings. This clearly is a phase of great experimentation. People have not seen rock cut architecture of this kind before. It's an idea that seems to come in from the western end of Asia through the Achaemenid Empire into India in Bihar and you see attempts at creating different shapes. In fact the openings to different caves are also different at this site. The most celebrated of these caves is the one called the Lomas Rushi cave. Celebrated because the entrance to the cave resembles a thatched hut. In fact, if you look at the image on the top left, you will see that the curvilinear roof line over the entrance has what look like wooden 
dentils or wooden joists projecting outwards, a clear case of building in stone what originally would be built in wood, like a much later Toda hut you see at the bottom. This cave is also interesting because once you get inside, you realize that the surfaces are completely polished till they have a kind of glaze and at the end of this long rectilinear hall which you see in plan is a small round hut built inside the living rock. This clearly is a replication of a hut that would house a holy man, perhaps the guru of the Ajavikas who would all assemble in the monsoons in this big hall while their leader was in the hut. A hut being the hut built in stone inside a cave. This is what the interior looks like. Now this idea that a hut houses a holy man or a holy presence is an idea that never goes away. It will survive through various Buddhist monuments, through Jain monuments and through Hindu monuments. And we'll see various iterations of this theme through the course of several hundred years. This is an image taken from a famous book on Indian architecture by an author, a scholar called Percy Brown. You later find similar kinds of arrangements where a hut housing a holy presence, in this case the presence is signified by a Buddhist stupa, at a cave site called Kondivte in Maharashtra. This is what the site at Kondivte looks like. So again you have a long assembly hall, inside which is a hut built in stone and inside the hut is a stupa which is meant to symbolize the presence of the Buddha. In the case of the Ajivika cave at Barabar hills, instead of a stupa, you actually had a living master who lived there for part of the year. The Achaemenids are replaced by the Seleucids and the Indo-Greeks and they too embrace Buddhism partially because of Ashoka's missionary efforts. And while they come with a lot of things like Greek coinage and Greek deities and so on, you start seeing elements of the local slowly seep into their culture, such as this chariot which is drawn by elephants on one of their coins. You also have a set of kingdoms called the Greco-Bactrian kingdoms, which slowly embrace Buddhism. And it is in these kingdoms that you start seeing stupas and also bilingual inscriptions of Ashoka in both Greek and Aramaic, sometimes in Kharoshti, the languages vary, the scripts vary. And it is from here in this period that you start seeing reliefs which show you the constructed stupas and how they are being worshipped by populations in the area. Note the clothes, note the postures of all these figures who are worshipping a stupa and you will see that they have the folds of their garments are like classical Greek sculpture. These are Hellenistic cultures in Asia. Note the columns which are an important marker of Greek architecture particularly when they have those kinds of ornate vegetal capitals on top. At a site called Aikhanum in Afghanistan, which is one of these Bactrian sites, one of these Hellenistic sites, a Greek settlement that's built, you find column capitals like the ones you have on the right hand side. The plate on the left shows you what later would be the standard orders of architecture in Greece and Rome, the Doric, the Ionic and the Corinthian and sometimes the Tuscan. But at Aikhanum, there is a local inventiveness and they have hybrid kinds of capitals and columns. And the same kinds of capitals were excavated at Patliputra in a palace that probably was a Mauryan palace. These have been well published and reside in the Patna Museum now.